So this morning, we're continuing on in our series in the book of James. We're moving into chapter 3 today. And um, last week, for those of you who were here, we, um, we left off discussing how God desires our faith to lead how we carry ourselves in the practical world. And um, God desires that as believers in Jesus, that we bear the fruit of righteousness in our lives by living out our faith out of love for God and for the other people that he puts in our path with us. So we're going to dive right into this message this morning and continue on this thought. Lord, we thank you for your word, the precious word that you've given to us, God, that brings life. We pray, O oh God, that you'd help us, Lord, to understand it, that you'd quicken our understanding with your Holy Spirit, Lord, and, and help us to be able to apply what we hear today. God, if there's folks that need encouragement, I pray that there would be encouragement. If there's folks that need a special, um, God, a, a special move forward in their, in their faith with you, Lord, I just pray, God, that you would, you would just um, advance their understanding of what what you're calling them to, Lord, and that you give them the faith that they need. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, coming to know our Savior ought not to just translate into a difference in how we live our own personal lives, but as we spoke on last week, it should reflect in um, how we live. And this morning, James gets into it and he says that it should reflect in what we say and how we say it. So James starts off by addressing those who would aspire to a leadership position of teaching in the church, and this is where he opens uh, Jane, with chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. We read, James says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. So, before we address what James has stated here in verse 1, I believe it would be helpful for us to discuss the calling of a teacher. Now, teaching, if you've read the New Testament, you'll see that teaching is one of the five spiritual leadership gifts given to Christ given by Christ to his church. And the church is the people, not just the institution, but the people that are sitting right here right now, people that are called by his name that have called on Christ to be their saviors. So it's written in Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 16. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measureness of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunningness, cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead of speaking the, truth, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Him who is the head, that is Christ. From Him the whole body joined is joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So, when you consider what we just read there, it's clear that the spiritual ministry gift of teaching is a divine calling. 
It's not just something that you can just pick and just go, I want to do that. It's actually a divine calling that God puts in the heart of specific people. Now, Christ gives these ministry gifts to people himself. And it's important for us to understand that when Christ gives that ministry gift, he does not make mistakes. If you've been called by Jesus to be a teacher, God has viewed this calling from every angle, from every possible angle. And if he has called you to it, you can be sure that he will give you the grace and power to exercise this gift effectively so that he could be glorified. Now, God has decreed that his gift of teaching is crucial to the proper development, health, and maturity of the body of believers of which he himself is the head. And the teacher, when you look at the gift of the teacher, the teacher has a special ability to clearly explain the truths in God's word and help people apply the truth effectively to their thinking and conduct in everyday living. The result of good spirit-led teaching is the forging of greater Christ-likeness within his church, and you are his church. So the gift is given to edify, to build up, and to strengthen people in their walk of faith. Teachers are tasked with the responsibility to communicate biblical truth that inspires greater obedience to God's word. They're also to challenge listeners simply and practically with the truths of Scripture. They're to focus on changing lives by helping others understand the Bible better and give attention to detail and accuracy in what God intended for His people to know. And they're also called to prepare through extended times of study and reflection. Now in verses 1 and 2 of our text today, We're warned by James that this ministry gift of teaching should not be approached without a great deal of consideration. It is a sobering fact that what a teacher teaches can sway or manipulate the faith and actions of those who are being taught. And sometimes teachers, if they're wrong in their um, exposition of God's Word can lead people into grave error that can cause a lot of damage. So teaching must be approached with care to ensure that the Word of God is taught in a a way that God intended for His Word to be taught. And for this reason, not many people should seek these teaching positions because teachers will be held accountable and will be judged more strictly by God for what they say to people than for others. Now, you notice the theme here? James has moved from uh, living faith in actions, but also in speech. And he's talking, first of all, to those who teach so that it sets the course. Now, some people desire teaching positions for the wrong reasons. Some people desire teaching positions because there is a sense of power and control over other people that can come with teaching. Some people, I guess, are approaching it and they want positions of teaching to buffet their own ego. But uh, if you look at this, there's a deep condemnation that resonates with an attitude like this towards teaching. There is accountability before God if someone takes on a position of teaching in the church. And the heart has to be in the right place. But should you steer away from teaching? Should everybody steer away from teaching? I know we need to approach this soberly, and we should be very careful on entering uh, a position of teaching. We want to be sure that God has called us to that. But sadly, this verse here itself has been a catalyst to steer many people away from fulfilling their God-ordained calling. Now, in the church is every single gift that is necessary for building a healthy body of believers and also for reaching the community and the influence that God puts in that church's uh, line of sight. Right? So God is not lacking 
within the church, in the people, you guys are the people, you guys are the church, there is every single gift that is necessary to have a healthy body. It, there is. God determines this, and He brings us together. You're not just here because of some coincidence. God in His sovereignty has brought each one of us to this place together because He desires us to give Him glory collectively. So within the body of Christ that is here, there are people that are called to the ministry of teaching. So don't look at this verse and say, oh, I don't think that I even want to go near teaching because I don't want that kind of uh, responsibility. So I don't think James is trying to discourage people who have been given the gift of teaching to avoid teaching. It does not say that all people should be avoid becoming teachers. It says that not many of you should become teachers. Those of you who do not have the gift of teaching, you have other gifts. And you should not become a teacher. And it's not just, be, just that teachers are some kind of, somehow superior or anything. No, it's just different. You may have different gifts that are behind the scenes or other gifts. But sometimes those other gifts, teachers that are supposed to be teaching, hide and go to some other gift that has less accountability because they're not willing There we go. So, there's people that have the gift of teaching that are not fulfilling their God-ordained call because they're afraid. They're afraid that they're going to get things wrong. Now, James is saying here that we ought to approach this position with sobriety and, and with consideration. But, and there is responsibility with commitment. But teaching is given to you, if you've got that gift, teaching has been given to you by Christ Himself. That gift is one of the, the things that Christ has given to His church so that the church can be made mature, at coming to the fullness of Christ. So, there's a call to be faithful with what you've been given. That goes for all gifts, by the way. If you're gifted in something and you're not exercising that gift, um, you're missing out. You really are. And also the church is crippled and it, it, it's hurting because you're not fulfilling God's ordained place for you in His body. Now, each of you is part of the body of Christ. Each and every one of you. You all have a role to play in Christ's kingdom. This is not a spectator's game. It's not a game. It's living our lives in real, realness and being real with one another and looking at one another as though we are precious to God because we are. And that heart of, of seeing other people as God sees them compels us to serve Him in the capacity that God has called us to. That's just a side note here. So if you're called to teach, you're called to be dedicated to that calling, you're called to be reliable in exercise of this Christ-given gift. The teachers give, or the scriptures give us clear instructions on what God requires of teachers. Paul writes to his apprentice Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witness, witnesses entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. So Paul is talking with Timothy. And he also says to Titus, in another one of his apprentices, Titus chapter 2, 7, and 8, he says, In everything set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. So further to that, concerning the seriousness of this calling, there's some people that have this gift that aren't quite ready to exercise it. So I would encourage you, if you've been given this gift, God wants you to pursue Him, to pursue closeness with Him. To, if you draw near to the Lord, He will draw near to you. That's a promise in the Word of God. If you seek the Lord with all your heart, He will, see, he will meet you right where you are and will impact your life powerfully. So if you're called to be a teacher, Hebrews 5 says in 12 to 14, there is this problem. In fact, 
though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone else to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So, there are those of us that are stunted in our spiritual growth because we haven't gone deep with Christ. And he's calling us to deep. God wants you to be deeply invested in a relationship with him. Your faith is all about relationships. It's not just about form. It's all about relationships. Relationships with God is number one. That's why God says, love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But it's also relationships with other. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you fulfill those two commands, you, you're, you're going to fulfill all the commandments of the Lord because those are the most important things. God is relational. He wants you to relate to him closely. He wants you to be close to him. He doesn't just want you to ride the, sh the shirt tails of someone else. He doesn't just want you to skirt on the edge of faith so that you kind of are there, but you're not really invested. No, he wants you to be invested, all invested, all in. And when you do that, you draw near to the Lord. You say, Lord, have, have mercy on me. You know how weak I am in myself, but I need you. And then God meets you where you are, and he will help you to grow closer to him. And when, you're growing clo when you grow closer to him, then you'll be able to effectively carry out the ministry that he has for you for the rest of the body of Christ. Because we don't serve ourselves. We serve the others that God has placed with us because we serve Him. He was the foot-washing master, remember? He didn't have to wash His disciples' feet, but He served. He came to seek and to save and to serve. And God calls us to serve in the same attitude that He has. So, as teachers, okay, the human condition... We don't necessarily want to put ourselves out because of the accountability that comes with that position. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. If God has called you to it, he's wanting you to step out in faith. Of course, when you're ready, maybe you're not ready. If you're not, press in. Draw close. God will show you the way. 2 Timothy chapter 2.15 says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. We have so many biblical resources in our hands today. You can look on the internet and you can find really profound, good things that, that will help you grow in your faith. Um, there's just so much there question is, is it a priority? God wants, God's calling you. Make this a priority. Make your calling to serve the Lord a priority, and He will direct your path. He'll show you, and if you're supposed to be a teacher, it will become apparent. So in proper context, the teacher who is never at fault in what they say is perfect and able to keep their whole body in check. Now, when we look at Galatians chapter 5, 20, 23, okay, it talks about the, I guess, the, the elements of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, people say fruits of the Spirit. No, no, it's not fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, the fruit of the Spirit is one, and it has characteristics associated with it. As a matter of fact, 12 characteristics associated with it because 12 represents God's whole people, right? It's everything. The fruit of the Spirit has 12 elements or characteristics and one of the characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Self-control is not native to the human being who is controlled by their sinful nature. We know this. Who here has struggled sometimes to control themselves? Eh? Are, you, are you, you here this morning? We've had this, right? We know this. Self-control is something that the Holy Spirit gives you as you yield to Him. One big thing about being a teacher is that you are called to control your tongue. And it's impossible to do this through straight human willpower alone. It's impossible. One's speech has much potential to encourage people to do great and holy things for God, but they are also, the, the tongue 
is also particularly liable to create mischief, division, discouragement, deception, or destruction when not properly regulated or controlled by the Holy Spirit. So if, if one is able to control the tongue, that same principle of spiritual discipline will affect that person's entire life for their good, and they will be given strength to live as a, in, in a disciplined way in other areas as well. So although the first three verses of this chapter fall into context with the issues of teachers keeping their tongues submitted to God, James makes it plain that sinful human nature readily expresses itself through the improper use of the tongue, and that's across the board with everybody. So, because of the fall, the fall in the garden with Adam and Eve, all human beings have lost dominion over this small piece of flesh because of sin. We're sinners. And as such, the tongue is a venting point for the sin that is contained deep within the human heart. And when it is not controlled by the Holy Spirit, it creates trouble wherever it manifests. Human nature does not have the ability or strength to control this little member of our body, does it? I know only God, only God can help bring it under control. So in verse 3, James continues his dialogue and he says, we put, when we put bits into the mouths of horses or make them obey this, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships for an example, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil amongst the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and itself is set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Quite the visual commentary, isn't it, of this little flesh thing in our mouths. In essence, James teaches us that it is impossible for a human being in, in, in his or her own strength to restrain the tongue. The tongue is the spokesperson for an unredeemed sinful nature that is carried with each person because of the fall. All of us are sinners. And unless our sinful nature is restrained, there will be trouble. There will be trouble. As a small rudder, it says here, is piloted by, piloted by a ship's captain, steering the whole ship so the tongue steers the whole man. The fruit of the Holy Spirit, which we mentioned, brings with it self-control. The mind controlled by the flesh is what? A pilot that will steer the ship with the rudder of his tongue into dangerous and destructive places. The tongue is like a small spark that causes a great forest fire. You guys know about that. We can attest to this, right? Over the last five years, we've seen how a small start leads to giant forest fires that destroy. I mean, our people have lost their homes over this. We've lost a great deal of our timber supply, putting our industrial jobs in the area in jeopardy. Such a small start of fire can cause such vast destruction. We can attest to that. The tongue, like a small spark, causes destruction. I don't know if you've been hurt by a small comment that was really inflamed. It was said with a devious uh, manner that really hit you down in the deepest core of your, your person. You know, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's not true. Sparks that fly from here destroy and wreak havoc in 
the uncontrolled sin nature. But my friends, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is good news for us this, this day. Your tongue does not have to be set on fire by hell. Like the apostles at Pentecost in the early church, tongues that we have as believers can be set ablaze by holy fire from heaven. And if God lights the fire and if God controls the fire within our tongue, we will be governed by the Holy Spirit. And then our tongue, which is otherwise untamable, can be a mighty tool for the kingdom of God, for His purposes, for winning the lost to Him and for building up our brothers and sisters in the church rather than tearing them down. Isn't that beautiful? God has given us this provision. We don't have to obey the sinful nature that we were born with, that we had inherited from Adam. We don't have to obey that nature. We can listen to the Lord and yield ourselves to Him. Romans, 5, Romans 8, 5 and 8 says this, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. We need to yield to the Spirit. James tells us in our text in verses 9 and 10, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. So James, if you've caught the first two chapters, what he's trying to say is he's trying to say, listen, people, Let's be sober and analyze what's going on in here. <laughs> is my faith genuine? Is that, am I genuinely saved? Or have I not really repented and yielded my spirit to Christ? There's a lot of Christians that call themselves Christians out there that are not true believers. They think they are because they go through some form, but their hearts have never been fully submitted to Christ. And James has a concern, and this is why he is addressing this in his book. He highlights the nature of the tongue of an unredeemed man or woman, and he contrasts it with the nature of the tongue of a redeemed person who has committed his or her life to Jesus Christ. The thought process is that a person who has been redeemed ought to be praising God with the fruit of his or her lips and should be an agent of encouragement and edification to the people that God has placed in their lives rather than being an agent of cursing and of tearing down. In Galatians 5, and I know this is a hard teaching, folks, but this is the reality. There's a lot of people out there that are religious, but they have no connection to the vine. There's no fruit. There's a form of godliness, but no power. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Proverbs chapter 6, 16 to 19. King Solomon says this, There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. It is interesting that out of the seven things that God absolutely detests, they're listed here. One of them has its foundation in pride. One has its foundation in violence. One has its foundation in perversity of thinking. And one has unrestrained pursuit of wicked activities. 
But of the seven detestable things, the seven detestable sins, three of them have to do with the tongue. Lying, really. If you look at this, you break it down. Lying, gossip, and dissension wreak havoc in the world wherever they go. And they should not be deemed as acceptable behaviors in God's church. James continues saying, can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. As born-again believers, we are called not to yield to the destructive patterns that we used to live by. You've been saved by God's grace. You've been set free from slavery to your flesh. This means that your tongue has been redeemed by God and you don't have to be the way that you used to any longer. The unbridled tongue is no longer the master of the true believer. A freshwater spring does not flow with salt water, friends. The redeemed tongue should not produce bitter speech. Its outflow should be uniformly good. This is a litmus test. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart today. See if there be anything in me that's wrong. Bring me back to the place where I need to be in my heart before you. Help me to see you as you see me. Help me to see you as you are. A tree is known for its character of the fruit that it bears. It can only produce that type of fruit that it was meant to naturally produce. A good tree will produce good fruit. This means that when you yield to the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will be evidenced in a kind, gentle, and self-controlled speech. This is the nature of the Holy Spirit. And when you are yielded to the Holy Spirit, gentleness and kindness and self-control are part and parcel with how you should expect God will help you to live. See? Not how you will live and forge yourself to be the person that God wants you to be in yourself. It's a yielding to the Spirit. The Spirit gives us life. The flesh cannot uh, forge the things that God wants to forge in us. We can't do it on our own strength. So I'm not saying that if you're struggling here, that you need to double down and just try harder. Work harder, work harder, work harder. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is yield. Yield. And the power of God will manifest inside of you and will help you to become the person that God wants you to be. That's what I'm saying. So, therefore, Paul says this. He agrees with James. And Paul says this in Romans 6. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but thank Jesus, you are under grace. What then shall we say? That we should sin because we're not under the law but under grace? By no means, Paul says. Don't you know that when you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. 
you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. So James is saying, with, with what Paul is saying here and what James is saying, they're all saying the same thing. I, I had another couple of verses, but for time's sake, I can't just get into them because it'd take me another half an hour. But in my research, I'm saying this same theme is run throughout all of the apostles. They're teaching the same thing. And, and what James is saying, reflect, folks. If we're still slaves to our sin nature, then we need to sincerely ask whether our faith in Christ has been sincerely saving faith. Do you have true saving faith in Jesus? Because if you do, it's going to be accompanied by repentance and you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's not going to be like you're going to be perfect, but you will have the unction. I should. There's this old word called unction when the Holy Spirit comes upon someone. Unction to obey. Unction to obey. Your heart is transformed. God's calling us to yield to that transforming call. And to repent if we find that we're not there. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you've been a religious person all your life, you need salvation by grace through Christ today. You can be truly saved. You don't have to just have this form of godliness and religion. You can have a heart change, and God will help you to be the person that He desires you to be, a person who pursues holy living, a person that, that, that craves to do righteous things. John, in closing, the Apostle John says in 1 John 1, 5-7, he says, This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But, here it is, but if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me today? I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you cared so much for us, that you gave yourself as an offering to save us from our sins. And by your grace, Lord, we have been given salvation for those of us who believe, Lord, your blood cleanses our sin and washes us as white as snow. We thank you for that, Lord. Today, God, there's those of us here who maybe have never really actually surrendered our lives to you. Maybe we've had a form of religious behavior, a form of godliness, but never truly surrendered. God, I pray for that person or those persons today that are hearing, whether it's online or here in the church building, God, that you would help them just to surrender. And today it's as simple as this. You surrender to Jesus Christ today. You say, Lord, I see that I need you. Be the sacrifice that washes away my sin. I want to place my trust in you. I want to give you all of me, Lord. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. And you surrender your heart to Jesus right now and you confess him with your mouth. The Spirit of God will save you. You will be saved and you will be filled with his Spirit. For those of you who are here today that are struggling, just turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you should be exercising a gift and you find that you haven't because you've been preoccupied with all kinds of other things, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your understanding. Pursue God and acknowledge Him with all your heart, and He will make your path straight. He'll make it clear where you are to serve. And if you're a teacher, you need to teach, but do it with all sobriety. If you have other gifts, then you need to serve and do it with a heart that is turned towards the Lord. We praise you, Jesus, and we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.